everybody. It's Dr. Eric Balcavage. We're back for another edition of the Thyroid Answers podcast. And today we have another guest. Uh, our guest today is Dr. Raphael Kelman. He is a medical physician, and we're going to get de- kind of deep into uh, some different things on thyroid physiology. We're going to talk about maybe a test that nobody's ever heard of, and maybe we'll have uh, some agreements on si- different things. But he is a functional, functionally uh, integrated medical doctor. So we're going to have some discussion about what got him there. But Dr. Kellerman, uh, thanks for joining us on the Thyroid Answers podcast. How are you doing today? Great, great. And thank you for having me. Sure. Pleasure. So we're going to talk about, you have a new book out, so we're going to talk about that in a bit. But first, I want to get in kind of into the nitty gritty of thyroid physiology, and especially maybe what's the allopathic kind of traditional training and then maybe what you're doing different. But if you can, give the listeners a little bit of, of a background of who you are as a medical physician uh, and then maybe your transition into a functional medicine. Sure, sure. So my training was in internal medicine. I graduated Albert Einstein uh, College of Medicine, um, you know, and I finished my training uh, in the 1990s. And you know, people always ask me, well, how did you transition into holistic or functional medicine? The truth is I never transitioned. It was always my orientation to understand uh, things from a more holistic, uh, ecological perspective. I studied philosophy of science in addition to philosophy in general. So I, I came to understand the paradigm of science in general, of, of what's called systems theory, of how uh, scientists understand nature uh, that it works in systems and ecosystems that that interact with each other to produce a whole that's greater than the sum of its parts. So I knew that medicine needs to be understood in a similar way, and that opened my eyes to looking at nature as a model, but also as a nature for into nature for answers and understanding how we could apply. Uh, both the principles of healing in nature and also what nature offers uh, to the um, to healing. And that's how I formulated my practice of medicine. And by the way, that's why um, I was one, I was the first, I wrote the first book on the microbiome for the lay public back in 2014. People always ask me, well, how did you get to know this? Well, very simple because I had my eye on nature from the, from the get go to teach me what healing is all about and that that's where healing comes from. It's the ultimate paradigm. And then I knew the benefits of bacteria for the general ecosystem for the world in general. So I knew that it would, it has a vital role in our own health too. So as soon as the science began to confirm all of this, I kind of put the pieces together. So that's, you know, that's my, my background and how I came to, uh, or be oriented in functional and holistic medicine, even before the word functional medicine was out there to the public. So that's my background. Um, my interest in thyroid disease also stems from my um, ecological perspective, because if you look at um, the research, it's, it's quite clear that thyroid disease is on, is on the rise. And and the and the reasons are very clear as well, mostly because of environmental toxins, that t- that affect the thyroid first and foremost. In addition to the brain, but the thyroid is very susceptible to environmental uh, toxins. So, knowing this, I I always knew that thyroid disease is a big problem. It must be a big problem because disease just doesn't come from the sky. It comes. There are reasons for it, and environmental toxicity is a fundamental cause of, of disease. So I was always looking closely into the, the thyroid as a possible cause for the types of pay, the problems that I was seeing in my, in, in my practice from the get-go. Fatigue, memory issues, weight gain, memory problems, uh, hair loss, you, you name it. And I was seeing so many of these patients and the routine tests were frequently not really showing me the diagnosis, even though I knew that their, all their symptoms were pointing in that direction. So I began to question the validity of the tests. And I came to the realization that blood testing is not always 
the perfect representation of problems going on in the body. Now, sometimes they are very helpful, but that doesn't mean they're always helpful. And in fact, they could be very, very misleading. So, um, and that, and there are numerous reasons for this. One in, the, in that the reference range could be very questionable, is very questionable. Uh, what is, let's say, a value of a thyroid hormone, let's say T4 or T3 or even TSH, a hormone that comes from the pituitary? Well, what's the normal reference range and who are they evaluating to determine what the reference range is? And is there an individualized reference range? In other words, let's say the range in a population of 50,000 people for TSH a hormone ranges from one to five. Well, that's very nice, but what's ideal for you? You know, what's ideal for you? Maybe it's instead of one to five, it's 1.9 to 2.4 and anything above and below is not good for you, period. Doesn't that make sense? Of course it makes sense. You don't need to be a, a scientist or a doctor to, to, to understand that. Um, additionally, we do not know for sure that what we pick up in the blood is an adequate representation of what's going on in the cells, in the tissues. Sometimes it is, maybe sometimes it's not. So, and additionally, the body tends to go into some homeostatic state that it doesn't necessarily reveal what's, what's going on in the blood uh, what's really happening on, on the physiological level because the, the, the body may be compensating and keeping the blood levels normal or somewhat close to normal. But if you delve deeper and stir things up, you'll see pathology. So when I, when I was in practice, um, I was seeing all these patients, the routine tests were not always picking up the problem. I frequently treated based on my my symptoms and my gut feeling. And I was seeing it, that people were responding and doing well. And there was a test, a better test called the TRH stimulation test that doctors were using. But then they stopped using it for different reasons, which is a whole discussion. And I said, no, I think that we should bring this test back. Why? Because it's a functional type of test. It's not just looking at static numbers in the blood but you're taking a hormone and you're stimulating the pituitary gland to respond. And if it releases a lot of TSH, which is a hormone that controls the thyroid, if it releases a lot, it's telling me that the pituitary, which controls the thyroid, is thinking that the thyroid is low. That's why it's pumping out a lot of TSH because it's always trying to stimulate it but we're not always seeing that in the routine test. I, this is a complicated thing. I'm not expecting it's not. It. It's really not. You're, my audience yeah. is used to me talking and similar stuff. So, but I want to slow you down a little bit so we can yeah. get an idea of what's going on here. So, when, when we're talking about as a medical physician, you're pretty much taught that there's two tests that are run to assess thyroid physiology. One of those is TSH, which is kind of the screening test. And if right. that's out of range, then there's a, a reflex to free T4. And so I'm guessing you were looking at those two tests and saying, hey, I've got a patient who's got hype, seems to have hypothyroid signs and symptoms that looks like they have so hypothyroid signs and symptoms. And then you were on saying, hey, but the, the, the lab is normal. And so then we talk about, and I talk about that all the time on, on the podcast. We talk, it's, I have it discussed in my book for ad nauseum that TSH is not always a kind of relative it's not always a great indicator of what's going on in the system for a number of reasons. And some of those you started to get into, but the, I think it'd be good for listeners to understand when they come to functional medicine or they listen to somebody like you, or they listen to somebody like me, and we talk about all the available thyroid tests that are out there, they go back to their allopathic physician or endocrinologist and ask for more of those tests to be completed. And the physician says, I don't need to do more tests. I only need a TSH and free T4. I don't need to run thyroid antibodies. I don't need to run T3, reverse T3, free T3, T3 uptake. 
And so they kind of look at their physician like they're, why are they not doing this for me? Why are they not looking at these things? So as a medical physician, what was the understanding as you went through your training as to why we don't need to run those tests because people think they're bad doctors. I, I, I keep saying the endocrinologist isn't necessarily a bad doctor. They're following the guidelines of what have been kind of laid out as to what to do, how, what tests to run and when to treat. So since you're from that world, how would you express why it's done that way? Right. A lot of it, believe it or not, is just habit, what people got used to. Um, the TSH is the the first one because they would say that, well, if your thyroid is low, then the pituitary gland, which controls it, would respond by producing more TSH, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's just measure that. But if you think about it, well, that's kind of weird. Why not just measure T3 and T4, the thyroid hormones, right? It's strange. Why are you looking at that? So you know what the answer is? It's very interesting. The answer is that because they're going to say that they're not very accurate. They could, they could change that, that, you know, the T3, T4 could fluctuate in the blood. Well, wait a minute. Now they're already agreeing with us that you can't rely on them because they're not consistent. They could fluctuate from day to day, even hour to hour. So implicit in their habits, they're agreeing that you can't always rely on these results because they could fluctuate and vacillate. Well, that's the same thing with the TSH, no? Why, why is the TSH any different? I, I, I really don't understand why they think that the TSH is more reliable than the T3, T4. It doesn't, I have no clue where they got that from. It's habit, I think. Maybe they thought, they think because that's more, that changes to a greater degree than the T3, T4 perhaps. I, I, it, it really doesn't make sense, but, or, or that, you know, when that's really, really high and that won't fluctuate as much when it starts going up that high, you know, I, I don't, I, I really don't know, but what's important is that they're already agreeing that the T3, T4 isn't always reliable because it could change. And the same thing is with the TSH that it could change as well. You see, they they used to think, well, only if it goes up really high, like 10 or something. That's also uh, erroneous. That That's based on uh, habit. There's no research to support that. That what, if your TSH is 6, you don't deserve to be on thyroid hormone? And what's interesting, the trend is that more and more endocrinologists are dropping that bar. For some reason, they used to first treat when it was 10 where they got this from was just based on, think about it, what kind of studies would you have to do to determine who would benefit when you treat when the TSH is six versus 10? You know, it, it's, it's, it's really more based on uh, either poor studies or just habit, what they got used to. And, and the trend is changing. Yeah, but that's problematic as well, because yeah. we're assuming that the issue is only a gland problem. And what we have to remember is thyroid gland production is only a part of the equation. Okay. There's a, another significant part of the equation, which is the cell regulation of thyroid hormones. So the okay. cellular system plays a role, right? Yeah. So if we're if we make the assumption that hypothyroidism only occurs when there's a loss of production and all we need to do is put thyroid hormone into the system and it will work then everybody who gets diagnosed with hypothyroidism should be better on T4 therapy maybe a minuscule amount of T3 but what we see is that while we can normalize TSH and create biochemical euthyroidism, we don't get well-being from our clients. And that's because of the cellular regulation of thyroid hormone. And most of our patients aren't operating from a state of homeostasis. They're operating from a state of allostasis, which is an excessive stress state, which I want to bring back and tie to that TSH. For the listeners, all of the tests that we do in a thyroid panel have importance to them. And I'll, I'll kind of 
give my in, my thought process insight as to why we wait till it's at, uh, at a certain level to, to provide thyroid hormone. Based on some of the literature uh, reading and, lit and search I've been done, done over the last two, almost three decades now, the problem that I think they found early on, especially looking at T3 and reverse T3, is that when they provided more T4, um, and they initially started to use reverse T3 as an indicator of how much thyroid hormone they were providing. Was it too much and too little? They would see T, reverse T3 in patients jack right up, and then they're going, oh, we're over-medicated, but the patient still wasn't feeling better. So at some point, the reverse T3 got scrapped altogether because it doesn't fit into the model that we're trying to do. But when we talk about TSH, the biggest influencer affecting TSH and thyroid physiology is often inflammation. And inflammation impacts the brain, the hypothalamus, differently than it does in the peripheral tissues. So at the That's hypothalamus true. level, right, we've got T inflammation increases deiodinase 2 activity, increases the conversion of T4 to T3. It's something called the, hypothal the hypothalamus. Yes. Yes. And when that happens, you get increased yes. T3 binding to the, T3, the receptors, and we get a down regulation of TRH. The deiodinase 3 enzyme actually gets down regulated in the right. hypothalamus That's under right. inflammatory conditions. You're totally right. Meanwhile, at the same time in the periphery, that same inflammatory molecule will often cause a down regulation of deiodinase 2 in the periphery and That's an right. increase in deiodinase 3 in the periphery. So the brain right. is getting is initially, at least while there's still enough T4 in the system, is actually getting increased its thyroid physiology while the peripheral tissue is downregulated. And, right. and the answer, the reason I usually give cl my clients for that is if you were being chased by the proverbial tiger, do, what do you need to work? Do you need your digestion to work? Or do you need your sex hormone regulation to work? Or do you need your brain to work so you can run? And most of us agree was like, okay, I'm in danger physiology. I'm not stopping to sleep. I'm not stopping to have sex. I'm not stopping to eat a meal. I need to protect myself. And so we need the brain to work. We need the other, the rest of the physiology to kind of slow down the metabolism a bit. Do you see it along the same lines? Absolutely. Uh, that's what I wrote, wrote about in, in my book, microbiome thyroid, the condition is called NTIS, non-thyroidal illness syndrome, which is ac exactly what you're describing, is that in states of inflammation, and many, many uh, um, problems can lead to inflammation, whether it's, uh, well, there's a whole list of things, obviously. Uh, these conditions can create, well, I, I, I look at it like this, any protracted health issue, especially, and the common denominator could absolutely be inflammation, uh, will cause those changes in the hypothalamus, causing a down-regulation of the signals coming from the hypothalamus to the pituitary, to the thyroid. So the numbers could look completely normal. In fact, the TSH could even look low, and it becomes very tricky. That's non-thyroidal illness syndrome. All your labs could be completely normal, and the TSH could actually look low, like 0.9, 0 0.8, and your T3, T4 could look normal. As it goes on, the T3 will begin to drop, but they could be completely deceiving and even deceiving to functional medicine doctors because they say, oh, the TSH is not high. It's not, it's not two. It's only 0.9. That's good. No, this could represent exactly what you're saying. The, the name to it is non NTIS, non-thyroid illness syndrome. And what I claim in the book is that there's a huge population of patients that have that. So if someone has chronic inflammation, like you said, and, and they have all these symptoms, you should really suspect NTIS and not look at those thyroid blood tests. They could be totally misleading. Yeah. And the problem is, and I know you're coming from the allopathic world. I came from the allopathic world. So I think I can jump in there and I'm not beating up, but in the allopathic world, that NTIS only seems to occur in critical crisis situations, right? Like hospital settings, persons yeah. dying, we see this. But in reality, when we look at the literature and the research, any state of chronic inflammation yeah. can cause a, and 
what I term that in my book, in my world, is cellular or tissue hypothyroidism. Okay. We we use we yeah. use the right. So it's just because when we think about what's causing hypothyroid signs and symptoms, yeah. it's what's happening at the cell and tissue yeah. level is which is resulting in the hypothyroid signs and symptoms. It's not necessarily dependent on the thyroid gland because if we take out the gland, we give you thyroid hormone. Now I have the hormone. Why is it still not working, right? So right. it's a tissue, tissues get to regulate at the end what's yeah. happening with that thyroid hormone. No, I totally agree. My argument in the book was that NTIS has to extend beyond the, the ICU and critical states. That is a very common problem. And it, all you need is, you know, chronic uh, Lyme or just chronic inflammation. The key word is chronicity, chronic, mm -hmm. that it has to be going on for a while. Chronic gut issues can also lead to NTIS, depression, anxiety, you name it, and, um, and now COVID as well. Now, you're absolutely right. The biggest part of the problem is uh, on a cellular level. Uh, what I was referring, because, because of the deiodinases that you were speaking about, and also inflammation in itself, will cause mitochondrial dysfunction. So the whole cell is not operating properly uh, anyway. And you could give all the thyroid hormone in the world and it's not gonna, exactly what you said. Um, the, the, the reason why I was uh, using the NTIS label, I'm also, I also believe that the amount of hormone that the body is producing is lower, even though you don't see it on the blood test. And the T3 in relationship to the T4 is going to be really low. So the problem is both on a cellular level and also on what's being produced, the amount and the ratio. So you're getting less T3, more production of reverse T3, higher T4. So the, the problem is on both ends. Oh, absolutely. And, and the I, issue is, is it all depends I, on where you're catching that person because yeah, depending yeah. on, yeah, so context matters, right? Yeah. And yes. so where am I catching this person in the crux of it, yes. which is yes. why I always tell the physicians I talk to, I teach the, my clients, you can't just look at a thyroid panel by itself yes. and yes. make a decision. Do we have a state of hypothyroidism in the, in, in the right. person, we have to look at context. Do I have signs and symptoms? What do the rest of the lab panel show? Yes. Do I have insulin resistance? Do I have elevated lipids? Do I have what tissues are being impacted? Do I have inflammation? So context does matter, right? Depending if you catch it early on, you may not, you may still see there's sufficient T4. If you catch it in more later down the line, there's no T4, there's no T3, there's even reverse T3 is going to be reduced because there's not enough T4 to be as a substrate to actually be deactivated. No, you're totally right. You're totally, the, the, uh, one of the ways of diagnosing this problem is, uh, and there are multiple ways, but, but when you do the TRH test, I see what we call a blunted response that the pituitary is just not responding to the, to the stimulation. And why is it not responding? Because it, it's, it's down-regulated. There's, there's very little TSH because it's not functioning properly because the, the signals from the hypothalamus is reduced. So it's just another way that I diagnose this condition. Um, but you could also make the um, inductive reasoning like you are, like if you, first of all, clinical symptoms and for sure is high, highest on the list. But also if you see markers of inflammation that are high, if you see many of the things that you just said, these are different ways of um, coming to the same conclusion. I just have seen the severity of it and how common it is because of the TRH test that I've been doing. And that's why I, the, the most important part of this book is about this NTIS. How you label it doesn't really matter um, your, your focus is more on a cellular level. And I totally agree with you. It's happening on both ends. But if we look at why, right? So at the end of the day, whether you have primary hypothyroidism, you have secondary, you have tertiary, you have thyroiditis, right? We ha the, the question always becomes, why is this going on? And that's what we're trying to do in functional medicine, say, why is this occurring? And there's a I think the traditional model might say, hey, listen, 
90 percent of these cases are immune driven it's autoimmune the, the the issue the cause is idiopathic meaning we don't know what it is we're just waiting for the thyroid gland to get destroyed to a point where you require thyroid hormone replacement we're going to give you t4 right that's the general consensus i think most physicians realize that the the primary driver is an immune driven problem i think what may, what separates allopathic medicine and functional medicine to some degree is that in functional medicine, we agree that it's immune driven problem often, especially in this country. And then if that is the case, what's driving the immune system? And it's probably some of the things you're talking about in your book we, and things I talk about in my book is physical stressors, chemical stressors, emotional stressors, microbial stressors, right? All these things that put excessive stress on the system that initiate danger physiology is gonna cause the body to adaptively downregulate the metabolism. Do you see that occurring or do you think that the thyroid, the downregulation of thyroid physiology is more just broken physiology? No, I, I look, I, obviously I look at things holistically and systemically and how the, the body is a, an integrated whole. Uh, stress, mental, emotional, psychological stress the state of your life, you know, what, what, how you're feeling about your, your life in general is, plays a critical role in, in your overall health. And, and we now know as well that the, the health of the microbiome will play a profound role in your, in your overall health. It will cause cellular dysfunction. You know, the mitochondria, which are uh, their, their origin is bacteria, uh, they communicate with the microbiome, so which is pheno- f- fascinating science that they have. They retain a memory of each other, and if there's problems in the in the uh, microbiome, it, you'll have problems in the mitochondria, and and if the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, um, as your audience knows is not functioning well, well, the whole cell is not going to function well. And as you say, that you could have all the, the thyroid hormone in the world, but the cell is not using it, it's not picking it up, it's not utilizing it properly, and, and it's a deranged cell. It's, it's just creating inflammation. So, but, but do you think that that is occurring because of why is the inflammation occurring? Is the inflammation occurring because that it's that the cells just sick or do you think that inflammation and the downregulation of the mitochondria is the result of something like oh, what is it well it's for sure the result of something what's causing the inflammation in the first place again you know if the microbiome is not healthy due to the foods we eat due to the medications we've been taking like proton pump inhibitors uh prilosec and pepsid and some of the and many of the others protonics um, if it's because of the overuse of antibiotics, um, if it's because of um, anything that <clears throat> will harm the, the gut wall, <clears throat> is it due to toxins in the environment? Is it due to inflammation from uh, viruses um, and other bacterial overgrowth uh, because of an imbalance in, in, in the internal ecosystem and how we respond uh, to the outside environment, which relates to biological resiliency um, and adaptability, uh, which then goes back and relates to your autonomic nervous system, your ability uh, to the flexibility of your of your body uh, to be able to respond to environmental um, and emotional mental stressors. But you know, there reaches a point where things just break down no matter how resilient your body may be. So it, it's that's why we have to be vigilant in, in doing as much as we can from a functional med- medicine perspective to build up biological resiliency. Okay, so let's do this. Let's you, In your book, you're talking about the microbiome and how it might impact thyroid physiology. So... Uh, everybody's talking about gut, leaky gut, but let's talk about the bacteria. How would bacteria influence thyroid signaling in general, and how would it influence damage at the thyroid gland? Can you get into that? Yeah, absolutely. So 
when there are problems in the uh, microbiome, uh, it will lead. It uh, it can lead, and often does, to uh, gut wall permeability issues, or also known as leaky gut, and that will cause translocation of bacteria, and meaning that bacteria will cross the gut, <clears throat> the gut wall. <clears throat> it will also lead to inflammation, and that inflammation becomes systemic, because the the immune system in the gut, the gut wall becomes activated, and to me. And that will lead to systemic inflammation. It can lead to autoimmunity, but just inflammation in, in itself will cause uh, thyroid dysfunction. Okay, so let's. So we got inflammation coming from the GI tract, right? Is how is that going to initiate changes in cellular thyroid physiology? So okay. the listener understands. Right. So it will lead to inflammation in the thyroid as well. And the thyroid gland will easily become disrupted in its function if there's inflammation. Um, it it self perpetuates, so it, it's it's very vulnerable to toxicity and inflammation. So then it will not function properly, and will lead to dysregulation of the thyroid, and that in turn will lead to dysregulation on a cellular cellular level as, as well, systemic cells. Um, so it's a multifactorial process that leads to general dysfunction and then a feedback loop of dysfunction as well. Let me jump in there for, for the listeners. One of the things, and I talk about this quite a bit. So when you have gut problems, and I, I'm just going to kind of take what he said and kind of kind of just change the kind of languaging a little bit. You can get, uh, there's multiple ways that the th that problems with gut bacteria can create problems with thyroid physiology. Definitely, we talked about the inflammatory effect, but when bacteria or bacterial toxins cross the barrier, they can initiate an upregulation of the immune system and the immune system is going to release inflammation. Inflammation is then a signaling molecule and it's going to, as he said, it's going to be systemic. And when you have inflammation, what we know, we can see in the periphery is we do get the down regulation, the cells that are impacted by that inflammation, their conversion of T4 to T3 is going to become down regulated. So you get a down regulation of the deiodinase 2 enzyme, you get an up regulation of the deiodinase 3 enzyme. So the net effect is a down regulation of tissue thyroid status. When you have those bacterial toxins, damage associated particles, we call those dams, pathogen associated molecular particles that are entering into the bloodstream, they are the things that activate the immune system, tell them where to go. But the thyroid gland also has pattern recognition receptors to pick up on these danger signals. And when they bind, they actually initiate the thyroiditis. And so that's been shown in the literature that it's almost a self-destruction mode. It is the, the thyroid cells themselves that actually become immune-like and actually send out the signaling molecules that, that essentially invite the lymphocytes to come in and do the damage and destruction. Some yeah. people think that's broken physiology. I'm more inclined to believe that's adaptive physiology to help slow down the metabolism and deal with the threat. But there are multiple ways from the bacteria themselves, the toxins that are released, the inflammation that's triggered by it, we can get, we can start to have this thyroiditis, this immune driven destruction of the gland. All right, right. so are so, you okay with all those ideas yeah, or concepts? Yeah. We're totally in agreement, but you, so you're saying that the, the dams molecules are an adaptive mechanism to slow down uh, the physiology. Yeah, I do, based on the literature and my yeah. interpretation of it. So here's what we see at the at the thyroids at, at individual cells themselves, right? So when we have a cell that's in threat, right, it activates the cell danger physiology. And part of that cell danger physiology is to stiffen the cell membranes. It creates hypoxia. The hypoxia helps you get hypoxia inducible factor that then causes a deactivation of thyroid hormone inside the cell. So we get a low T3 state. Why would that why would that be beneficial? Go ahead. Right. No, no, that, I was just going to ask you that question. Uh, I'll take a take a, a shot at it and you tell me what you think. I, I believe that it's a kind of hibernation state that the body goes into that it, it prefers to just slow down its function and metabolism and produce less 
because if it's producing the normal amount, it will lead to actually more inflammation. And then that, that could lead to cancer and death. So the body goes into this uh, hibernation state. What's your take? Well, my, my take, my bias based on the literature is pretty similar, but that activation, uh, the deactivation of thyroid hormone inside the cell is a protective mechanism from a perspective of when there's a threat, what's the role inside the cell is to increase the level of free radicals to deal with the threat. Okay. Oxidative stress goes up. Wait, so are you saying that the oxidative stress deals with the stress? It deals with it? How does that help with the stress? So if I've got a back, if I've got an organism inside the cell, part of what the cell does protectively is to increase free radical production to deal with the threat. Right. But let's say it's not an organism. Let's say it's not a bacterial infection. It's just inflammation. Why would it then increase more inflammation by itself? So when you have a, when you have those inflammatory cytokines hitting the tissue, that act, that stimulates a stress response on the cell or the tissue. Why would it be beneficial, therefore, to downregulate cell metabolism? You have a limited amount of antioxidants produced inside the cell, right? Yes. And the amount of antioxidants produced in the cell are, are generally there to support the oxidative stress that's caused by normal cellular physiology. Your mitochondria generates a waste as it produces ATP. Would you agree with that? Of course. Right. So we, as a byproduct of ATP production in the mitochondria, I get some free radicals. And the cool thing about cellular intelligence is I also make these things called antioxidants in the cell to keep that redox balance, right? Right. If... I have ox- increased free radicals that are in that are elevated as a response to danger signals. It doesn't have to be a bacterial virus; could be a toxin, could be whatever. And I have the same amount of oxidants generated from the mitochondria. Now I have excessive oxidation. I overwhelm the antioxidant capacity. And now I've get the oxidative stress that damages a cell. A cell does not want to do that. So it's an ad- there's an adaptive response to downregulate mitochondrial numbers and function in an excessive stress, stress state at the cell level. So, yeah. right. Yeah. So mitochondrial, there's lots of things that can create some issues, from a mitochondrial standpoint, but the down regulation of cell metabolism is often more adaptive to the threat. It doesn't matter necessarily yeah. what it is. If it's emotional stress, if it's chemical stress, yeah. if it's toxin, yeah. if it's a virus, yeah. like yeah. somebody says, well, it's what if it's Epstein Barr? Doesn't matter, right? Yeah. It doesn't no, matter yeah. if it's 10 days of, di- of no sleep uh, yeah. or disordered breathing. We're going to still have, once we activate those da- that danger physiology, We've yeah. got to shift resources from manufacturing yes. to oh, sorry, cell defense. Sorry, sorry, we're in agreement. Yeah, no, it's, we're yeah, that, no, that's good. But that's the. I think that's the a, a key piece when we're talking about why do people continue to not feel good? Is we assume that if we just give them more thyroid hormone, it's got to work, right? Um, but maybe we're talking to a patient who's not in homeostasis. We're talking the patient in front of us is in allostasis and they're in adaptive physiology, but we need our job is to help them uncover what those stressors, what's causing that stressor response, right? What's causing that danger response. So when you're working with clients and you're seeing this signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism, and your, T- your TSH and T4 comes back, I'm assuming you don't, that's not just what you run at this point. What are you looking at from their physiology standpoint to tell you, hey, I think I've got some type of secondary hypothyroid situation going on, NTIS, cellular hypothyroidism, whatever you want to term it. What tells you, hey, I've got to take a deeper look or maybe I need to do this TRH test because there is, as you're probably well aware, there's some controversy regarding the test. And so what would make you say, well, I need to do this test? The controversy regarding the test is uh, coming from people who have no knowledge of the test and they're just talking it, nonsense. You isn't know, that so, often the case though? Yeah. <laughs> nonsense, you know, it, because 
it's just ridiculous. It's not FDA approved. Therefore, so what? It's just absurd. And I, I have plenty of studies that came to the same conclusion that the TRH test is needed and it's safe and important. And sometimes it's very, very important to use. I'm not, for me, it's just another tool to help diagnose uh, what I'm suspecting. Uh, it's a totally safe test. Anyone who says otherwise is, is saying this based on ignorance and arrogance. And let's leave it for that, period. I'm the one who uses the test. I've done tens of thousands of them over 20 years. And if anyone knows, it's me. I do it on two-year-old kids. I've cha It's changed the lives of children with autism, developmental disorders, and for many, many, many other disorders. But it's not. It's, I'm not open for discussion because I use it. If someone else has used it and done a study, then fine, then we could have a discussion about it. So let's put that aside. Um, and it's totally safe, and I'm the one to, to prove that. Now, in terms of other ways of coming to this conclusion, well, you could measure inflammatory markers. You could measure cytokines. It's not a cheap test, but you could do it. Sometimes I do it, and, and I see it. There are some cheaper tests like CRP and you could also do or ESR. You could you could also do um, an autoimmune panel, and and that frequently the insurance covers frequently. Um, and then you may you may pick up signs of autoimmunity. But the the most important way is evaluation of cytokines. Now you can also look into the gut. If you know if you do a very extensive test with the right lab, you know I use Vibrant Labs, and mm -hmm. it will show you if you have. Um, intestinal permeability and with really good science behind it based on solid research. And if you have intestinal permeability, you have to use inductive reasoning in medicine if you want to be a decent or a good doctor. If you see intestinal permeability, and then as you say, if you're familiar with the literature and, and you have an ability to think a little bit, a little bit, and you're not just focusing on drug therapy. You don't need to be a genius. You just need to have a different paradigm and think creatively and inductively. You'll come to the conclusion that this is what's going on on a cellular level. Yeah, I, I think innately our patients realize that, hey, I have hypothyroidism, right? I, I've got the signs and symptoms. I have all the classic signs and symptoms. I don't, it doesn't matter what my TSH is. And they realize it that they're, and that's what pulls them out of traditional allopathic medicine, brings them to functional medicine because they're frustrated. Like I, I know my thyroid physiology is not working, and they're relying on one or two tests. And then, but we can see, we have to look at the patient. We look at a thyroid panel. We look at the rest of the metabolic panel for markers that tell us, hey, I've got tissue hypothyroidism indicators: elevated lipids, fatty liver disease, insulin resistance, right? We, and I think we talk about, you know, I think this, the statistics are that like 20%, uh, maybe 10 to 20% of the population has uh, some level of hypothyroidism. I think those numbers are probably closer to 50% of the population. I totally agree. Totally, totally Because agree. if 50% of the population is overweight or, or obese, when those numbers climbing each year, how Absolutely. do you get overweight or obese to begin with? If we understand general metabolism, if you eat more, your metabolism goes up, your thyroid physiology goes up unless there's a problem with the tissue regulation of thyroid yeah, hormone, right? Absolutely. I totally agree. And now with, you know, post COVID, there's more inflammation, vaccine, more inflammation, you know, and not only that, if you have another disease, let's say you have Lyme or something like that, or mold, you invariably, you're going to have concomitant thyroid dysfunction on a cellular level, or call it another thing, NTIS. You, you can have problems on both ends of the spectrum. And Oh, no, so, I think we're totally in agreement there, right? Yeah. The issue is that when you have that Lyme infection, that is going to do, induce that slowdown of metabolism, it, right? So if I have a- can't only, You can't, I'm sorry, go ahead, I'm sorry. If you have the virus, if you have an organism inside the cell, do I want to bring more glucose in? Do I want to bring more iron in that cell? Do I want to make more peptides for that organism to use and nourish and flourish? 
No, that's the whole idea of stiffening the cell membrane, right? Decreasing transport of nutrients into the cell. Why? We want to induce that cellular autophagy to start cleaning up the debris and try and find and address the organism that's in there. That's part of that defensive response, right? So we're going to see the implication when we see infections, when we see toxicity, it shouldn't be that we're surprised by a level of tissue hypothyroidism. We should expect it, right? right? That's an adaptive so response. Use, so you would, would you, you would use antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds, I assume. To some degree, yeah, absolutely. But I, again, it comes down to it, what, what's the cause, right? So if you have a person who is has significant emotional stress, right? I got to deal with their the trick that emotional stress. Yeah. If I have a patient with yeah. organisms, right, I got to adjust their organisms. If I have a patient with gut dysbiosis and the bacterial translocation or toxin translocation, I need to deal with that. And as you know, and I know, often it's not the thing, it's the load, right? The load of stressors over time, the cumulative chronic overload without recovery is what creates it, right? Stresses can have an hormetic effect, right? It makes us stronger. When I go lift, I build bigger muscles. I break it down, I create some inflammation, I build a big, bigger muscle. That inflammation helps attract stem cells to grow bigger, stronger cells. So I need some stress. But Absolutely. when that stress is unrelenting, that's yeah. when we get into trouble. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, so, yeah, it's great. So, so when you see somebody struggling with a thyroid condition, you do your TRH test and say, hey, look, I can see that there's a lack of stimulation of the adrenal gland because I just put a bunch of TRH in, hypothalamus not, may not, must not be releasing TRH. Explain the test findings and the results for somebody. What are you learning from that experience? If the hypothalamus, hypothalamus is when you're doing TRH and it creates TSH upregulation and up, maybe upregulation of thyroid hormone, what is that telling you? Can you explain that to the client or to the to the viewers or listeners? When I do the TRH test, so we're injecting a hormone from the hypothalamus and that stimulates the pituitary. So there's two possible outcomes. One is that in a regular hypothyroidism, uh, you're going to get a very, very high output of TSH. And then even though the routine TSH may be questionable, you're going to see a big burst of TSH. And then you're going to know, wow, this person really is low thyroid, even though the regular level of TSH is questionable. Sometimes it could only, it may only be 2.4. And then when we do the stimulation, we see a big output, then we know the thyroid is low. In the, in the state where there's inflammation, that's the big driver of the problem, you're going to see a low output of TSH because everything, the signals are decreased, you see? And, and then when you combine that with other labs, uh, and the T3, T4 will depend on the, on the state, on what level the, the cellular dysfunction is at and the level of inflammation and how long it's been going on. Uh, and then the reverse T3 may also change accordingly. So you combine that with um, markers of inflammation. And by the way, you could also do um, uh, fatty acid tests on in a cell. There's a company that does the fatty acids inside the cell. And if we see imbalances in, in omega-3 and omega-6, in, 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 and it actually determines cellular inflammation, um, it's called the brain span test. And we, you put all this information together and then you could determine what's going on on a cellular level. And then it's pretty clear uh, whether we're dealing with cellular dysfunction, secondary hypothyroidism, tissue dysregulation, cellular issues, or you're dealing with primary hypothyroidism. And, and you just got to put the, the data together. So what's, what do you see as the difference? Because in an inflammatory pattern, you're going to get an increased conversion of T4 to T3 at those tannocytes in the hypothalamus. Therefore, TRH is going to be suppressed because there's plenty of T4 getting right, converted right. there. You're gonna, you're gonna what's the a, difference in the pituitary gland that you're seeing when right. you do the test? Yeah. yeah, you're going to see less TSH being secreted mm -hmm. upon stimulation. Okay, I have a I have a patient waiting for me. Um, 
I know this has been great. You you have a could we just sum it up or I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. So to finish off the discussion, I knew I know you need to go. Um you've got a book called The Microbiome. You've got some different types of tests and and um tools that you use to not only assess thyroid physiology or and to address and to treat thyroid physiology. If people want to learn more about what you do and what maybe make what you do differently, where can they go? So it's the KelmanCenter.com. Um, that's our website, Kelman Center. I, I can leave the phone number too, if you don't mind. Uh, 212-717-1118. It's again, 212-717-1118. And it'd be a pleasure to see uh, anyone uh, who I could help. Sure. So it was, uh, unfortunately, we were cutting this short because Dr. Kelman's got a, a client that he's got to go see, and maybe we'll finish this conversation sometime in the future. But he also has a book out, call, out called The Thyroid. Called micro, microbiome Thyroid. Okay. And then The Microbiome Diet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's about 800 reviews on that. And uh, they're, they're pretty positive, And people could see the benefit of improving the microbiome. So it's called the microbiome diet and microbiome thyroid. And um, yeah, I think it's going to help people if they read the book. All right. Well, I appreciate you coming back on. We'll let you get back to work and maybe and we'll finish this conversation on I'd another love, call. I would love to. And thank you so much for having me. Very, very um, gracious of you. Thank you. You got it. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.